in Jesus. While looking back over his life, he began to think back to the night he was born again and the rich life he had since that night. And he began with, I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. While realizing the love of God had sustained him and brought him to where he was that day, he's quoted as having said that he felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit to add the verse, I heard about his healing of his saving power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. When he completed the song, he looked back over it and saw that it was the story of the redeeming power from start to finish. He wanted the song to be joyous. And while written during the darkest period of his life, during this time that he was at the stroke, he was largely incapacitated, he was bedridden, he made the melody full of enthusiasm and happiness. Since he could no longer travel to minister or teach, his son Eugene Jr. took over. And one night, the story goes that he traveled to East Texas for a revival service, and he had asked a well-known um, evangelist to speak. And it was a wonderful sermon, but no one came forward. And then he felt the Lord urging him to sing his father's new song, which he had not sung publicly before. And when he did, many came to forward to give their life to Jesus. At the end of the service, 50 men and women had accepted Christ as their Savior. During his time of suffering, he found the inspiration to declare, I cry, dear Lord, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought me the victory. In the midst of his troubles, he could say, victory in Jesus. And he passed away in 1941 at age 66 due to complications of that stroke. So Sometimes we don't feel very peppy, but sometimes just hearing that song can at least elevate us, lift us up, even just for that short time. And I would have never imagined that he would have written that during the time that he was incapacitated with this stroke. Let's sing the song. <laughs>
glory and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me for that beautiful song of victory in Jesus. And hearing this so uh, story behind that is also uh, in empowering. Many times in our lowest times is when we receive that peace from God and reminder of who he is through Jesus in our lives. So again, thank you for that beautiful opening song. want to uh, welcome everyone to our service this morning here at Ephrata, Alive Church Ephrata both here in the sanctuary and also those joining by live stream. As we come together to fellowship in worship, first of all, to worship God, first of all, and then to hear from his word, and then to fellowship with one another, to give each other uh, encouragement uh, for our journey forward. As a live church, effort, um, through Jesus Christ, we want to offer hope, life, and love in Jesus name to those we meet with and interact with on a daily basis so again welcome in the name of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to a live church effort I was telling Jim earlier I came to church feeling half dressed <laughs> I got to pull into the parking lot and realized I don't have my cell phone on me what does that say about our culture today when you don't feel you're completely dressed without a cell phone? Fortunately, Jan Janet had hers along, so I don't know how we did it before, but it was amazing how we were tied into that. So I, if I feel a little lost, maybe it's because I don't have my cell phone as my crutch. Just a reminder for announcements to read through the bulletin that you received. Um, again, a reminder for our time of prayer Wednesday evenings um, here at the church. At 7 o'clock, we invite you to come for a time of sharing and uh, prayer time of concerns. Also, uh, a note in the Moms Alive uh, announcement that's in your bulletin, there was an incorrect um, number. Um, it says that they would uh, they need, first of all, uh, folks uh, to take care of the children, children's care, and uh, in the bulletin it says they will pay $25 a a time it's actually thirty dollars so any questions there's a contact a number in there as well also want to give an update on Andrea uh, who is now out of YWAM uh, according to Ken they made it out safely with a few minor glitches I guess out in Ohio on the way they went for the brakes and the pedal went to the floor and if you ever drove that is not a fun feeling uh, fortunately, they were able to get off the highway and get to a Meineke, and they were able to fix it for them right away, and they were able to get back on the road yet that day. Uh, so the Lord was with them, I believe, in that. Uh, that could have been a lot worse if they needed breaks immediately. So, But she did get out there uh, fine, and we will be praying for her a little bit later in our, our pastoral prayer. Um, Tree also wanted to thank the Brubaker children for helping her get all the stuff from one room to another for their children's church uh, go and grow this morning. Uh, so she was here at 8 o'clock and they were very helpful in getting that accomplished. So we have our future trustee, I believe, with uh, who is helping this morning. So. so if you get a chance to see them, say thank you to them. Again, a uh, reminder to read through the bulletin for any other items that might pertain to you as well. This time, I invite you to stand as we uh, recite the memory verse from Isaiah. We will recite the t um, citation, the text, and the citation. And we're also going to be blessed at the end of the service as this being our benediction. Uh, Timmy and Garrett will be dismissing us with this at our benediction. So join with me, Isaiah 
41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41.10. You may be seated. Not sure why we were jumping back and forth, but that happens. So, As we come to our time of call to worship, I want to read from the psalmist, Psalm 5. And I do so in preparation for our time of pastoral prayer. And I want to spend an extended period of time in prayer for the situation throughout the world, mainly with Haiti and Afghanistan. And I'll direct you through that, how we will go about that this morning. But Psalm 5 says this, as our call to worship, the psalmist uh, praying to the Lord says, listen to our words, Lord. Consider our lament. Hear our cry for help, our King and our God. For to you we pray. In the morning, Lord, you hear our voice. In the morning, we lay our requests before you and wait expectantly. And so as a time of pastoral prayer, I'm opening up for all of us to be a part of that. Let me read from Philippians this um, request from Paul to the church. He says this, do not be anxious about anything, a very uh, familiar verse, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. During our prayer time on Wednesday, we had focused upon the issue of Afghanistan, and it just was laid upon my heart that we as a church here need to lift up those who are in need around the world. And so I'm going to guide us on a focused, extended prayer time this morning as we think about the situations. You see, we need to stand in the gap with prayers of intercession for those who are in need. I don't know if you would have received emails, but um, we received an email from Zachary and Stevie Estime about the earthquake in Haiti and what's happening there. Also, Austin from YWAM Lancaster sent out an email about Afghanistan and what's happening there. And so what I'd like to do this morning is have you participate. Uh, I'm going to read emails for both situations and we'll spend a time of prayer at the end of each email to pray for the needs of of those situations. And what I'm going to invite you to do is where you're at, just you can pray silently or you can pray out loud. I know our young adults used to call this a prayer tornado where we all pray before the Lord. And I think it helps us to focus uh, if we are engaged with that, whether it's silently or out loud. And so I want us to join in these concentrated prayers for the the needs that we see in the news uh, today. So let's start with, and then at the very end, we will then pray for Andrea and Austin and the community as a closing out our prayer time. Uh, And that I will just pray then for those. First of all, the email from Zachary and Stevie Estime on the earthquake in Haiti. She wrote a 7.2 magnitude earthquake hit Haiti on August the 14th. It's even more powerful than the 7.0 magnitude earthquake that hit in 2010, which killed nearly 300,000 people in Haiti. Now, this particular earthquake was uh, 80 miles to the west of Port-au-Prince, so it was not in a very populated area, but there was definitely destruction of property and uh, loss of life uh, around 1,300, and there might be more since then. Um, Hundreds of thousands of homes and buildings were completely destroyed. They live more to the northern part of Haiti, so they did not experience any damage. They did experience some of the earthquake. Um, But here's one of the concerns, the children. She said, the kids are definitely shaken up, and you can feel the tension in the air as they are many who suffered from the trauma of their experiences in the 2010 earthquake. So this brings back 
not so good memories. Um, also, Zachary's uh, family um, are, were safe. Um, and so the, the prayer concern is for, first of all, the relief. I think I heard on the news that MCC has, has been sending or has sent some uh, emergency kits to Haiti. So we want to pray for, first of all, for the children and the trauma that they've experienced. Uh, for the loss of life of those who've experienced that, uh, with family and mem friends, the loss of property and destruction, um, and just overall health, and also as organizations start the uh, relief effort. Now she ends her email by saying, above all, please join us in prayer over this country of Haiti. Haiti really can't seem to catch a break. Yes, these people are amazingly resilient, but they're proven time and which they have proven time and time again, but they are still human and can only handle so much. So I'm going to invite us to a time of prayer for Haiti at this point. And again, feel free to just pray out loud from where you're sitting or, or in silence. And I'm going to step to the side of the mic to pray for my myself uh, and then come back and then we'll uh, think of Afghanistan. So join me in a time of prayer for Haiti. And those on live stream, please feel free to join in as well in your homes. Join in. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. For Haiti, we just pray that you will answer and be near to those experiencing the challenge and loss of property and life. And now to share the email on, on Afghanistan. We've all seen the news. It's nothing new to add that uh, the Taliban has taken over control of Af Afghanistan. The president has fled the country. There seems to be a lot of unstable this at in Afghanistan and some of the concerns that are in the email here especially for the Muslim women who fear their rights that the last 20 years have been granted to them will be stripped away um, pray for the nation of Afghanistan in these areas pray for the women especially many women fear that the Taliban rule will mean they would be stripped of their opportunities of education Women involved in education during the past years could also be at risk, so pray for their protection. Pray for the sick. Uh, the COVID virus, and, uh, we don't see it in the news, is, is running rampant there as well, and of course, with the uh, injuries of the chaos, praying for the uh, hospitals and the medical staff there as well is important. And pray that the country will not be a haven for extremists. Over the last 20 years, it seems like the government has been an enabler for organizations to be a part of that country. And so with this newfound control, the Taliban could be a host for new generations of terror groups. And hopefully it doesn't go that route, but we want to pray for that. Pray also for the displaced, the refugees that are starting to happen. And we will probably be have the opportunity to help in that area in the near future as Church World Services and those start working with the refugees to be re, uh, to placed here in the states. And so we want to pray for those who have been displaced. Also want to pray for the, the Christian church there, the, uh, the underground church, quite frankly, um, the small groups of believers there in the country. We just pray that um, they will have peace, that they will have uh, wisdom and strength during this time. Uh, Austin writes in the email that, um, that they are the 
largest, second largest group, um, fastest moving group in that area, only to Iran. So the church is growing underground rapidly. But the concern is for the pastors of the churches who registered um, over the last year or so as a church, now their names and lists are now available to those who have taken control. So again, these are some areas that we want to, to pray about um, for the women, for the sick, for the refugees that will be happening, the government itself, um, and also the church. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ when they're in a time of need. So again, I invite you to join me in prayer for Afghanistan. Father, just hear our prayers for Afghanistan and, and be in support of the believers there and the refugees there being displaced. Um, be with us as we have the opportunity to help in whatever way, first of all, in prayer, but also whatever er areas of opportunity come, may we be open to that. We just thank you for what you will do in Afghanistan. At this time, then, I pray for our local community and for Andrea and Austin as they are serving in YWAM and for the rest of our service. So please join me as I pray. Gracious Father, we pray now for Andrea as she is starting her service with YWAM Montana, the Titus Project. We thank you for your safety you've given to her and Dawn on the trip out to um, Montana. We just pray that you will continue to be with her as she prepares for your service for you and teaching others on how to teach the word. Bless her in this journey. Be with her during this time of service. We also pray for Austin Klein as he is with YWAM Lancaster. We just pray you will be with him and the opportunities he has to share his giftings with, with the ministry there and his opportunity to, to be a part of the ministry at YWAM Lancaster and what that all entails. We just pray a blessing upon him and the ministry there at YWAM Lancaster. And dear Lord, we just think of the local community around us as we interact with them, dear Lord. Give us the opportunity to live out our love for you by showing our love to them as well, to share the good news of the gospel as it, as it, as it comes to that opportunity, dear Lord, and how we can relate and show your love to those around us. We just thank you for that opportunity and pray you will continue to encourage us and empower us to do that. And now, dear Lord, as we go through the remainder of our worship service, we just pray that you will continue to guide us, be with us, be with Jim as he brings your word. Dear Lord, open our hearts and our spirit to what you would have for us. And we just pray your blessing upon this time of worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you join us in worshiping his holy name and blessing the Lord? If you would like to, you may stand. If you prefer to be seated, you may do that also. Let's sing, Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, oh my soul, worship his whole.
the sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord. I 
It's almost been maybe even a couple years ago when we had the last time in our Sunday school time we had a hymn sing. There was a song that was requested back then, and it's up on your screen. We're going to ask you to turn to it. It's uh, the Mennonite hymnal number 587. It was a wonderful, wonderful word of the Lord. And I know at the time when we were singing it, I thought, wow, that's a powerful song. And then I kind of forgot about it. But in the last few weeks, the song has been coming back in my mind. And I love the last chorus. And we know that when time and the world pass away, God's word will forever endure. Let's sing all four verses. Wonderful, wonderful word of the Lord, true wisdom is pages on And though we may read them a thousand times more, they never know, never grow old. Each line is a treasure, each promise a pearl that all of them and we know that when time and the world pass away, God's word shall forever endure. Oh, wonderful, wonderful word of the Lord, the land that our Father above so kindly has lighted teach us a way that leads to the arms of his love. His warnings, his counsels are faithful and just. His judgments are perfect and pure. And we know that when time and the world pass away, God's word shall forever Oh, wonderful, wonderful word of the Lord, our only salvation is there. It carries conviction down deep in the heart and shows us ourselves as we are. It tells of our Savior and points to the cross where pardon we now secure, for we know that when time and the world pass away, God's word shall forever endure. Oh, wonderful, wonderful word of the Lord, the hope of our friends in the past. His truths were so firmly 
Amen. We thank you, Lord, that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will never pass away. We can stand on it. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. So we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11 today. I want to mention a couple of things to you first, more of a, a personal note just to keep you posted on things. So um, in September, in the middle of the month, I'm going to be having knee replacement on my left knee and eventually the right knee too. I know you walk me walking around, maybe you don't it look like, oh, you don't look like you're in much uh, discomfort, but I can't walk for more than a few minutes and I load up on Advil. <laughs> so you see the good side. My, my family can tell you I put it off forever. So anyway, that's going to be happening. I just wanted you to be aware. So I'll miss probably two or three Sundays. Hopefully that's all. And I'll still be able to be on the computer, phone calls, still could talk to people, Zoom and all the rest. So, but that'll be the 16th of September I'm having that. So I want you to be aware of that. And then, this is a little trickier to try to explain in a, in a minute, but I'm, I will give it a shot. And that is, um, we're reaching an age, my wife and I, I'm 65, <laughs> where we're looking at down the road where we want to kind of land. We've been all over the place. I saw somebody on Facebook posted recently, the average person moves 11 times in their lives. And it said, how many of you, and I lost count at 22. Yeah. <laughs> Even when we were in New York, we planted a church. We were only there five years, but we moved four times because every place we were renting kept getting sold. And we had to keep moving all around in Hackensack, New Jersey. So it adds up. Anyway, we've done that a lot. And we said, we've got to figure things out here while we have a time to do it. So this was trying to be smart about, okay, right now I'm still working. If we wait till I retire from ministry, we're not going to be able to do anything, you know what I mean, unless we're already settled, which we're not. We've never done that. So we, um, her sister, who we're really close with, her, she and her husband were buying a house down in, or building a house in South Carolina. So we kind of looked at that, and it was crazy to even think about doing anything, but we, we started to, backed off, and then we, just one last shot, we looked at a house and said, let's just put, a, put an offer and see what happens. Didn't seem likely, but we, God was good. It turned out that the, they had had it on the market, and it got pulled out from under them at the last minute. They were just anxious to sell, and they would have had lots of offers. But we put an offer on the, the minute it went online, and they immediately accepted. And then it was still a lot to do, but we got accepted recently here now. And my family, so here's what's happening. This is the part that takes like two minutes. This won't be long, but I want you to get some sense here. So this Wednesday, my wife and son are moving to South Carolina, <laughs> to the house. I'll still be up here, and what we'll do is just you know, you, you know, you hear the famous people all have the East Coast, West Coast thing going. You know, we can't do that. We do that. We're doing the little mini thing here where we're going to be just going back and forth a lot in the meantime. Fortunately, where we are is I'm a half hour from Lehigh Valley Airport, and there's a direct flight right to where we're going. So, and it's very cheap. So I'll be able to do these, like, Wednesday through Saturday things when I need to, and they can come. And so we'll, we're going to manage it. I know it sounds, it sounds, to a lot of people, it sounds crazy. I actually, when we first even had the idea, I ran it by Bishop um, Brian and Eric. I said, I need outside voices sometimes because to hear, what do you think of this? And they said, I'm, I could see it. So, and we, were, and believe me, every step of the way, we were praying, we were looking, at, and it were things, like, I'm not going to get it all into it, but, I mean, it was God. Things happened that didn't look like they were going to. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. And my wife wanted me to tell you, so I will. I've mentioned to a couple of you already privately that she said, tell them the reason they haven't seen me around is because the first couple of weeks I was there when you were there, she said she loved it. I found it a place I would want to invest in. I could see myself settling into, and I knew that wasn't going to happen. So I didn't want to, you know what I mean, kind of be here and kind of not be here. So she just started going to a church that nobody knows her right near where we live in the meantime. So she, like, fell in love with you guys right away. And I uh, wanted you to know that, that they're not seeing her isn't because, oh, well, I said hello, that's good enough. It was that, you know, I don't want to get myself all attached and then having to pull right away. So anyway, just wanted you to be aware of those two things and, um, you know, be praying for us. And it's kind of an interesting thing. I thought about saying that at the end. Usually I'd say, well, I will throw that in at the end before I close. But I'm going to be talking today about living faith and talking about that. And this is all comes into it. Sometimes when preachers preach, it's because they look, there's all different reasons you ask preachers. Why did you preach what you preached that week? And there's all different reasons. 
but this one I know comes out of what God's doing in me these days, and I know it's something that's applicable for all of us. So I hope that that comes across here as we talk. So you can ask me afterwards if you have any more questions on those things. I know I kind of was brief. Okay, so let's look here in Hebrews chapter 11. Yes, the great faith chapter of the Bible. Got the NIV up there, as I've said before. Whatever version you have is great. Don't worry about not having the same one because the more variety of ways of looking at it kind of gives you a fuller picture a lot. This is the New King James, though. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. I love that. Sometimes, you know, the King James is, uh, it muddles things or it makes it hard to understand. People say, well, I've had people say to me, it's, it's almost like reading Shakespeare. It's the same. King James was the king when Shakespeare was writing. <laughs> it was the same years. <laughs> so yes, it is like that. But sometimes like this, it captures things. Being an English teacher and a history teacher, I hate when they do all the, if you have kids and they go to school, they give them now no fear Shakespeare. And they make it modern English. Now the good thing is the kids get the idea. They, don't, they know exactly what's going on in the story if they bother to read it. But the bad part is they miss all what makes Shakespeare Shakespeare. And this is, but this is the same with the King James here. We say, well, we've, we've made it nice, you know. So look at, that's actually interesting, right? Confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. I'm sorry. That's not the same as substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. That says it better. That says it better. So I want you to see some things here about faith. And faith, faith matters, you know, I know I got saved in the late 70s, 1979, and I remember one of the first things I had, uh, my guy who was kind of my mentor at the time was telling me all the time was there was a lot of concern about the hyper-faith movement. And you, we know there was a lot of crazy stuff. Still some of those people are around getting, you know, getting rich just telling you how to send them money. <laughs> they say, you'll get rich, but they're the ones that get rich. I, I get that. But we've made faith out to be a dirty word. Oh, you're not into faith, are you? We better be into faith, you know? Or if we say, well, most of the church isn't, you know what I would say then? That explains a lot. We need to be into faith, and I'll let the devil use bad ex experiences or some things that have been messed up to scare us away. Faith is important. And here's a perfect example. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for. It's substance. It's real. that'll work it's real and what we have to do what do we what do we mean by what do we have to do to what does this mean faith it means seeing the invisible the evidence of things not seen whereas it's seeing the invisible look in verses 24 to 27 here in chapter 11 with moses by faith moses when he became of age refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of god than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward. For by faith he, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So he didn't know what was going to happen. You know, Moses didn't know how things were going to turn out. He knew the, that the, what was going to happen, the wrath of the king. You know, he knew that was all coming, but it said, What? He looked, he could, he could see him who is invisible. Faith means seeing the invisible. I'm, what I'm hoping to, to uh, really talk here as we're talking today is for us to see that sometimes we get talking about things like faith and hope and all these Christian things, and we just kind of want definitions. You know what I mean? We want to make sure we have our theology correct. But that's not what it's for. You know, our knowledge has to be mixed with faith to come alive. <laughs> and that's what God wants us to have. And if we're going to see things happen in our time, and if we're going to see God move, he's asking us to have some faith. And so we have to be able to see the invisible. And Moses saw the invisible. And we look back sometimes and we say, yeah, well, he saw the burning bush. If, I had, if God spoke to me out of a burning bush, I'd know what that, I'd be able to follow him too, right? Don't we think that sometimes? 
But you know what? You know what Moses would say? If he was told, if somebody sat Moses down and said, someday there's going to be people that when they put their faith and hope in God, you know what happens? He's going to take up residence in them by his spirit, and they're going to be guided by his spirit. And you know what Moses would say? That's not fair. Well, they'll never go wrong. They'll do everything right. Of course, they'll trust God. I mean, if they got the Holy Spirit in them, I had to listen to, I had one time a direction, and then had to go forth and every day asking God to speak, not knowing when he would tell me or what he would tell me. You see what I'm saying? We let ourselves, we say that about that. They had this, they had that. Man, they didn't have the whole same spirit that raised Christ from the dead living in them. <laughs> we do. So kind of without excuse. And we need to understand that. With what Moses had, we have. We have access to. You know, I love reading revival history, and I will encourage you again, read biographies of famous Christians. Read revival history. Not just because, oh, it's cool and it's exciting, but it gives you vision when you look and see what really happened. I mean, we all know oh, what, comes after, what comes from revival is great enough, but read about the history of how it came about. The Hebrides revival back in the 40s, I think it was from that one. It might have been the one in Scotland at the turn of the century right before Azusa Street, but it was one of the two over there in Scotland. Uh, there, were, there was a lady... She and some of her friends had been praying and praying and praying for revival. The church was just dead or all over the place. And as they prayed, they really began to sense that God was saying, I'm going to send it. I'm going to send it. You're going to see. I'm going to pour out my spirit, and it's going to be unbelievable. This long lady went to her pastor and said, Pastor, we need to enlarge the church. He said, what are you talking about? She said, we've been praying. God's going to send revival. He's going to send his spirit. And we only have room here for about 100 people. And he said, but we only have 15 that come on Sunday. So 100 is more than enough room. And she said, yes, for now. But what about when God sends his spirit? He goes, well, I mean, of course we'll have to make adjustments if that happens. You know, he thought she was crazy. She kept bugging him about it, and he wouldn't do anything. You know what she did? She enlarged her house. She had her living room <laughs> knocked out, knocked out the walls, and, then, and made a huge place there that could sit a lot more people than that. I don't know how it, I can't imagine what it looked like. And you know what happened? Revival came. And guess where the meetings had to be held? In her living room. That became the church for a while. She believed. She could see the invisible. She heard it. She said, well, that would mean. And she could see it and believe it. Folks, we are talking even about here, okay? Let's breathe brass tacks. A live church. It's not going to be enough for us to just talk about it, hope about it, and hope something goes right and things work out. God is saying, do you believe? Do you really believe? Because we say we believe that God's doing something, that he wants to do something, that he's still got things ahead for us. But you know what? It's not like watching a TV show where you watch the end of it and it says, it says something's going to happen and you go and you shut the light off and you wait till next Thursday night and turn it on again to see what happens this, this episode. We are, as I said earlier, one of the other messages I preached, we're not the audience. We're not spectators. We are the players. We are on the stage. We are the end-time army of God. We keep praying for God to do something with his end-time army. That's you and me. When we read these things about Moses and stuff, somebody had to do that. These people had to actually stand up and say, okay, you're talking to me. Moses, you know, everybody was saying we want a deliverer. But God said, well, it's going to work through people. It's not magic. And we're praying for a revival. We're praying that God does something. I believe he's stirring us. But I believe also that what the devil wants to do is lull us into a sense of, but, it, but all we can do is wait and see what he does. All we can do is just, you know, and we, we'll use the faith words. All we can do is pray and believe. Well, I have a friend who was, in a, was a youth pastor when, on staff with me at a church I was at years ago, and he had an expression, you probably heard variations on it, but it stuck with me back then. He said, if you tell me that you're praying for rain tomorrow, he said, I don't care if the sun's shining bright when you go out, I expect you to walk out there with an umbrella. And that may sound simple, but he, I knew what he was saying. <laughs> he said, we pray but we don't act like we're expecting what we're praying for. 
So if we're saying, Lord, help us to reach our neighbors, well then, you know what we should be doing every day? We should have our eyes and ears open. We should be praying in the morning and saying, Lord, who is it today? Who are you sending me to today? Help me to see what I haven't been seeing. Help me to look beyond myself. Help me to understand that usually when you ask to pray, there's a part of us that's part of the answer. Remember when Jesus sent out the 72? It, and remember right before that, what did he do? He told his disciples, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out workers. Then it says, then he sent them out. <laughs> We're praying for God to move. But you know what we got to believe? That means he's going to move you and me. <laughs> Not somebody else, you and me. Yeah, he'll move other people. But if you know that old joke about everybody thought somebody would do it, but nobody did, and all that kind of thing? That's what happens with Christians a lot. We all talk about it, and they say, well, they're praying about it. The intercessors are on it, and we're believing for it. Okay. Who's taking a step of faith anywhere in here? Who's doing anything that shows that they believe something's going to happen? We need to start thinking that way. We need to believe. We need to look at opp find opportunities. I'm just going to bring one up, and um, I know you guys aren't used to me. Do, you know, I, did this, I do this stuff. <laughs> so you <laughs> just get it. But... Um, I know I mentioned a while back some, they had come to us th that they wanted to start up again the pace meals once a month. And when we first discussed doing that, I spoke recently to the pace director. She was thrilled. She said, that was such a good thing. And she said, because it really brought connection. And I know a lot of the kids look forward to it. There were family members who, who, who that brought them in. And she said, it really was a good thing. So I'm hoping we can do that. And now I just hear that so far nobody has responded to that. The, the, the request, the word, the, the word was, well, maybe we need to do the, sit, you know, put it aside. We get all spiritual. That must mean it's not time. I'm not spiritual enough for that. Sorry. I don't think that's the problem. <laughs> I think the problem is, is that we're so used to just going, oh, I don't know what. I'm not sure what we should do, that we don't do the things we can. I know we have a heart to. I know we want to. But I think sometimes we just kind of, you know, Things have gone a certain way, and we just go, I don't know. I don't know what I can do. I don't know if I should, ah. Uh, and, and we just kind of get paralyzed. Instead of saying, start with what we know. Is that something we need another 50, we need, do we need 200 more people in here to do that? No. Do we need special giftings that aren't present in our, no. Cook some meals once a month. You don't have to do it once a month. Some people, somebody has to do it. So in other words, different times you do it, and then hang out here and get to meet some people. We can do that, Right? right? If we say we want to reach our neighbors and they're coming right into our building and we don't want, and we refuse to take advantage of that opportunity, how can we go to God and say, please God, show us how to reach them? Right? Is it me? Or is that, does that, that, that sound crazy? They're right here. Let's reach the ones he has sent us. That he said, here's the golden opportunity and it doesn't take much. If we're not going to do that, I'm afraid to think about praying for anything more. So let's, please, think about even just that opportunity, even those of you who are watching on video, you know, let the office know, email them or call them and say, yeah, I could do that. And let's do that. That's something we can do and be excited about and make a difference and reach. And you know, here's the other thing we have to be careful about with that. Why do we do it? Because it's, we believe that God wants us to matter and make a difference. Not because, oh, how many people are going to come to the church out of that? That's not the point. God doesn't work the way we do. You know what God sees? They're faithful in little, I'll give them much. It's not necessarily they'll all come, but he, can, he knows now you're trustworthy, he'll send others. This is how God works. You've tr you show yourself you're trustworthy in what, what he presents to you to do that is no great reward for you. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do and it shows that you care. And then he starts sending other people to you that actually benefit you and benefit the congregation, and you go, oh, wow, that was pretty cool. We didn't even work at that. Yeah, you did, just not the way you thought. God looks at the heart. God looks and says, you know, I'm going to get back to it later again, but he says right in this section, what does it say in verse uh, 6? Without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He rewards us for diligently seeking him. Not for being gifted, not for being amazing, not for having a lot of money or doing this or doing that. Or 
he, he, he rewards those who diligently seek him. We need to diligently seek him. We need to see the invisible. As I mentioned last week, you've got to get the clutter out. As Jeff even mentioned this morning, we were joking about it, but it is kind of convicting, isn't it? How a lot of us are. And I mean, me too. If I don't have my phone with me, I go, oh. oh. And if I'm 10 miles from home and I've just realized it, I mean, I have a serious discussion with myself. Do I have time to go back home and get that before I get where I'm going? You know, that's, well, anybody who needs me is going to, you know, it's, it's crazy. And like I said, we used to do fine without it, but now, but I'm just saying, there's so many noises out there, so many things in the world. We need to get back to focusing on saying, Lord, what are the very simple things? Let me just focus. What can I do? Look at our neighbors. Look who's around us. Who do we see all the time? Do we witness to them? Do we love them? Are we friends enough with them that we have opportunities to show them the love of Christ even? Or do we just always say hi to everybody and not get too, you know, it's, it get messy? In order, to, to, in order to make a difference in somebody's life, you're going to have to get involved. We have to get more messy. I know a lot of people, you do all this. I'm not saying nobody does this. But I'm just saying all these different things, there's different aspects of it that we have to think about. So I hope, hope you will. And then another part of faith, <laughs> these are biggies, right? See the invisible. How about believing the impossible? <laughs> you see, faith isn't just, I mean, like we, we, we put in for the house. We were praying and saying, God, you know, if this is your will, if it's not, we can accept that. And there were times it looked like it wasn't going to happen. It did. But our part was, even going to do that, I felt was a step of faith. You know what I mean? There's a lot of things that are very difficult about this. For, for us, you know, being separated, even though we're going to get together a lot, it's kind of like, okay, I hope we can handle this all right. But I'm saying that part was tough, but the part along the way, once we had done it, it was up to God. It wasn't me like exercising great faith. It was just saying, we're going to have to accept whatever God does here. But there are times when he calls us to take steps and to trust him in ways that are kind of weird and to believe him in times when you say, how can you believe that? And, you know, look down in... Um, Again, in chapter 11 here, it tells us about Abraham. Skipping all over. I didn't write down the verse, so now... Do, 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 do. Verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your, she, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. What he's saying is, he told, think about it, he had promised Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And just think of all he went through before he even had Isaac. Right? Think of that whole thing. That's a fascinating, fascinating study to do a Bible study on. So much there. But then he has him, and here he's, as he's, he's finally starting to grow up, and God says, sacrifice him. Well, if, my seed, if his seed, is my seed, through him is going to bless the world, if he dies, that can't happen. It's impossible. And yet, Abraham is faithful to go and do it. Why? It says here, he believed, well, then God must going to be raised him from the dead. And he said, in a figurative sense, he did. He was death sentenced, ready to kill him, and he sent the ram in the bushes. You know the story, the angel holds his hand. But just think about this, what he was willing to do. He was believing God for the impossible. He, st he wasn't thinking that's the end of the promise. It tells us, no, he was, he was already figuring out how could this still happen. He'd have to raise him from the dead. Well, that's impossible, yeah, but he's got to do it because he said. <laughs> because he said. What has God said? What does God want to do? And now, you know, we have to understand that's what he wants to do. How many, you know, telling them you're gonna, your descendants will be more than the stars on the sky, the sands, the grains of sand on the beach. Look at that, it's crazy thinking. And yet today you look in the world and the three great world monotheistic religions, religions period, right? Christianity, Islam, and uh, Judaism, all of them, right at the center is Abraham. <laughs> Even us, he's the father of our faith. And Why? Because he believed God. How do we know he believed God? Because he acted. Many of you probably know James, the book of James, where it says, faith without works is dead. That James got in a lot of trouble. That book got in trouble as time went on. And even during the Reformation, there were great 
Martin Luther wanted the book cast out. He didn't want to count it in the Bible. He said, that's a mistake. It has bad theology in it. <laughs> James was a rough character. <laughs> and he was very boom, boom, boom. But, and he said, that's bad. It's not bad theology. He wasn't saying we get saved by works. But he said, what? If there's no works, I doubt your faith. Isn't that very similar to saying that there's fruit? There should be fruit. Jesus said, you'll know a tree by its fruit. So if we say we are people of faith, we need to start thinking, I think, more about, Lord, in today's world, what kind of steps of faith are we talking about? What does that mean, steps of faith for me? I don't know if I told you when I first, one of the first times I was here about this lady over in England who had, she was an older woman, had, and she was, couldn't get around much anymore and was really feeling like there's nothing left for me to do for God. She'd always been very active for the Lord, and she said, I just really feel so bad. She began praying. God, please, I, I don't want to, I'm praying and doing things, but I, I want to still be involved with people. I want to do something. And as she prayed one day, she told the story later, she said, the Lord put me in mind of that there was a, a young lady's college right nearby where I lived. And I said, Lord, I can't get over there. <laughs> you know, I just really can't. And she said, the more I thought about it, I said, but they could come here. And she put up a nice little ad in the, she had somebody put an ad over there in the student union kind of place. And she knew just what these young ladies think of away from home at a college. And what did it say? Do you miss grandma's scones and tea? Every Tuesday at 11 o'clock or 11.30, whatever, she arranged it for their lunch schedule, said, come on over to so-and-so's house, you know, and, and I'd be glad to spend. And so she started offering that. And people started coming. And she did that for the next either 10 or 11 years. And during that time, over 200 girls came to the Lord and many of them became missionaries and et cetera. From the inspiration from her and the Bible studies they used to do and the stories they told and hung out. And I love that story because you know what? She looked and said, God, I still want to, I still want to do something. She reached out. She, he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him, of them who diligently seek him. She sought him and said, I still want something, please. God gave it to her. Another thing I want you to see there, there's so much I wanted to hit here today. I know it's too much. But in her story, you know what I love? There was no burning bush, no voice from heaven. She said, I was praying, and God put me in mind of the girls. I'm wondering how, to, uh, how many times God is trying to show us things. He is answering our prayers, but he's not answering the way we're used to thinking. And I don't know if we're, again, I don't know you guys that well, a lot of you, I don't know if you're used to thinking that way or not. That, you know, God will speak to you. <laughs> and, and, you know, we think if, if it's not a, the voice of God or it doesn't say it in print in the Bible, then it must just be me. Don't you ever just go, oh, that was a crazy thought. Oh, you just kind of shrug it off and move on. And I wonder how many times it's God saying to her, you know, like, there's a girl's college over here. She could just go, oh, that's not, oh, why am I getting distracted while I'm praying? <laughs> you're, you know what I mean? I do that. Don't you ever? And you wonder, I wonder sometimes if we're shrugging off God, that it's actually God putting ideas in our head. I want us to be careful again, and I know this is, I don't know why I'm just kind of letting loose here today, but I am about this, is to say, sometimes we say, all I know is if it's not here, that's how God speaks to me, and that's the only way. Well, in here, you know what it says? It says in here, he speaks by Visions, dreams, words of knowledge, circumstances, that's in here. So when people tell me, oh no, I, only I don't believe in all that stuff, it's got to be in here. And I say, well, that's in there. No, what I'm telling you is in there. <laughs> you can't have it both ways. You can't tell me, I only believe this book, and I'm telling you, well, that's what the book says. <laughs> God wants to speak to you and me. He just, he, and if we will, listen, he will. And even if we're not listening, a lot of times he is, but I want us to have more faith than ever that he's going to. That if we go to him and say, Lord, yes, I want, it to, I want to make a difference. I know I've, you've put me here. I want to be like Esther who sees I'm here for such a time as this. And she needed some coaxing to see that. You know? Mordecai's the one who had to say it to her. <laughs> what if you've been put for such a time as this? And he even said, he even said to her, you know, and don't kid yourself. If you, if you chicken out, you'll just die with the rest of us. He's not going to spare you too. So she got coaxed into it, but she got it. 
But you and I, you say, oh, I'm not a Bible character. Well, yeah, we are. We are. Because Jesus prayed for the apostles and all those who would come after. Peter talked about the prophecy in um, Joel, Joel there about the, what would God come at the end times and the great signs and wonders. And he said, this promise is for you. And Peter, when he preached it, quoted it and said, this promise is for you and for all those who come after. That's you and me. We're in there. He wants to speak to us. He wants to show us and then help us to believe for the impossible. Believing God. Such an important thing. Believing God. But you know, <laughs> it's easy to believe God, though, if we just limit ourselves to what it is we're going to believe Him. I taught at a school years ago that was very much into just what's in the Word, God does no miracles, all the supernatural stuff went out with the early church. It's solely, totally unscriptural. We've been taught it, and he, and he was the headmaster, and we all sat at this, we used to pray in the mornings at school. I used to get so frustrated because we'd sit there and go around with all the prayer requests, and then we would pray, so Lord, you hear all these things, and you do according to your will, whatever you want to do, you know. I'm saying, well, then why do we need prayer requests? If all we're ever going to pray is God's will, God's will is for us to intercede. Again, I only want what's in the book. Well, James says, fervent prayers of a righteous man avail them. How can you fervently pray, God, just do what you're going to do anyway? God, please just be God. Please just do whatever you were going to do. It's hard to get fervent about that. You know, but he's, that's what he's going to do. He's going he's to do that. But he's saying pray. You say, well, we have to change God's mind. No, prayer is a very mysterious thing. No, we're working with God, but he tells us to pray fervent prayers. There's lots of examples of it in Scripture. And we can start with praying, God, help me to have that kind of faith. I'm diligently seeking you for the faith that's in this same chapter that I'm reading that word in. That word says, you'll reward those who diligently seek you. I'm not just seeking you so that I live a better life and I don't sin so much. But Lord, I'm seeking you that you would fill me with faith, that you would show me, help me to see what you really want to do even in me and through me and how I can be a part of what you're doing in this world today. Lord, I want that. And he's going to answer that. He's going to show us things beyond what we could imagine. So seeing the invisible, believing the impossible, and then finally, believing that such faith is possible for you. So we can look at that and say, seeing the invisible, those are great things, but. That, so this last thing is the but. Yo, for you, for you. And you know, I was, I'm always struck by, we quote um, Isaiah 53, you know, the suffering servant, all about what happened with uh, Jesus, the prophecies about him. But it's interesting, Isaiah 52 has a lot of, it starts at the end of Isaiah 52. Remember, these are artificial separations. You know, when Isaiah wrote it, he didn't say, now I think I'll do chapter 53. Later on, it was separated just to help us have reference points in the, in the book. So I'm just going to read a little bit here to you. And um, The last three verses of Isaiah 52 are, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage or face was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what they had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Now comes Isaiah 53. And before we get into the prophecy, you know what it says first? Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So Isaiah is writing there about all these prophecies about the coming Messiah. And then right in between them, he sandwiches, it's like when Paul does 1 Corinthians 13 about love in between 12 and 14, all about the gifts. We realize he's saying this stuff doesn't work unless you've got the love. Here we have the a prophet Isaiah telling us prophecy, prophecy, and in the middle of it he says, to who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He's saying, I'm giving you all this stuff, but who believes it? Who's believing my report? Who really believes it? And then what does that really mean? He goes even further. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who gets it? What God can really do? Plain English. That's what he's really saying. Who really believes what we're saying? And who really gets that what God wants to do and can do? Who really gets that? And then he goes on more prophecy. Faith. Faith. 
we need to pursue Jesus, but we have to say, Jesus, I don't want to just fellowship with you and follow you to the degree that is comfortable for me. But I want to step into the unknown where only you can take me. <laughs> you know, when we walked in, in fact, I just happened to think when I walked in this morning, that's what was playing was the music to uh, Oceans, in the background, stepping into the unknown. Only you can go, going deeper, deeper. All that stuff, that's good. That's sound biblical theology. That's what God's calling us to, you know? He rewards those who diligently seek him. And the other part about all this is, it's a process. It's a process. That's why I say I'm really being honest with you and saying as I'm talking about all this, it's because I am really, you know, in my own life going, oh my gosh, all this stuff that's happening right now, and we really have sought the Lord and feel like it's the Lord and still going, oh, and I, I mean, think of Abraham and Sarah. It tells us Abraham believed God. It was, you know, he believed this promise. And then what happens? He interacts with his wife, and next thing you know, they're, they agree to let somebody else have the baby. Right? All this goes crazy, and it finally comes back. But I'm saying, even Abraham, the father of our faith, he made mistakes. He learned as he went. Then later, what is it? What happens? He goes with Sarah. He's traveling, or before, he was traveling with Sarah. And what happens? They go to a, two different times. He goes to a foreign country and he lies and lets them think that's his sister. Why? He was scared. <laughs> this is what I love about the Bible is because when we want to look at these people and say, well, they're you know, Bible characters. They're not real people. This, this, no, they're real people. The same David who was a man after God's own heart, you know, had a, committed adultery with one of his, his generals Kid, uh, wives, and then had the guy killed so he wouldn't find out. That's David. You got Abraham, the father of our faith, and then he goes and totally tries to undermine the Lord's plan. <laughs> you know? So this is a battle we all go through. I'm, I go through still, you know? And uh, I'm just looking and saying, but God, but God, look. And as we looked at the, and heard from, from Jeff this morning about what's going on, particularly in Afghanistan, but it's going on in many places in the world people, the persecution people are receiving, they're being murdered. They've, they sent word out before they ever got to the airport. You know what they did? Not just the publicly churches. They know the underground churches. They have people planted. They do the same thing in China. And what they did was they started sending out letters to these different churches telling them, we know who you are and we know where you meet. And a lot of those people started writing home to their supporters saying, please be praying because we know they're coming for us. But here's, here's, what, here's what hits me when I hear that kind of stuff, is to pray for them, of course, but to also look and say, which was interesting is when you talk about where is, the, where is Christianity growing? Where is there revival? And as he said there, the two places in the world where, it's the, where it was the highest recently, Iran, where they kill you if you're a Christian, and Afghanistan, where they kill you if you're a Christian, <laughs> or try to, especially with the Taliban now. They will. But there was a time when they didn't, but Iran still was. Isn't that interesting? And where is it dying out? In the United States, where it's so easy to be a Christian. And I am challenged as I'm hearing, I'm saying, these people, how do you think the Christian church grew in Afghanistan? You think the church with the best band grew? Right? Think about that. Or Iran, do you think that's it? You know, whoever gets the most famous speakers to come in on Sundays. All the things in our country that we think about, no, no. You know what it is? The ones who risked everything and shared with their neighbors, knowing that those neighbors could just as soon turn them in and have them killed. But they were willing to reach out. That's the only way the underground church grows, is reaching out to the people right around you. And you're doing it at risk of your life. And I'm thinking, if they're doing that, and willing to do it enough that the church is growing like wildfire, and then it's not just growing in people who are willing to come, but because they've counted the cost, they are so committed. Then how about us, when we say, we need to start telling people about Jesus? We say, well, I don't know who to tell. I don't know if the people want to hear it. A lot of people I know are already Christians. We, have, we, we sit here, and how does that sound compared to these people who, when we say, they get told, go tell Jesus, it could be a death, you know, sign of their death warrant. They still say, yes, you're right, I'll go tell them. I'll tell everybody. That's how seriously we need to start 
We need to start taking, living, having a living, active faith that says, man, it's not just a matter of we need to grow our church. It's that we need to be the church. We need to be doing the work of the kingdom. If we're doing all that, the church will grow. <laughs> that, that will be not an issue at all. But are we busy being disciples of Christ? Are we busy saying, time is short, it's time to throw the salt everywhere. It's time to take the top off that lamp and let everybody see it. It's time to stop hinting at people that it's not, it would be nice to go to church and start telling them, you need Jesus. <laughs> it's just time. It's time for me. It's time for you. For those of you who are watching, it's time. Scary? Yes. But not as scary as it is for people who are actually doing it around the world. That's scary. You and I might get embarrassed, shunned by a couple of people. They're, di they're dying, but they're doing it, and it's so real and so genuine that it's spreading like wildfire, even where it costs lives. This is what Jesus meant on the last and great day of the feast when he stood up and heard them celebrating they were doing their feast. And Jesus went there incognito. He had sent the disciples into Jerusalem and told them he'd wait out there. But then after they went, he went in anyway, snuck into the city. Mind his own business. And here's the humanity and the, to me of Jesus. The humanity and the, the divinity all coming together. So Jesus is there trying to mind his own business, just watching. But by the end of the feast, they've done all the feast things. They've done church, in other words, high church. They've done, you know, I, I grew up Catholic, you know, and I mean, you know, you know they did the, the incense and the candles. We did the whole thing. The bishop was there and we did all this. And Jesus watches all this, and they're getting ready to leave. And you know what Jesus realizes? They're leaving the way they came. They're leaving here powerless and hopeless. And so Jesus, who, remember, snuck in there incognito, nobody would know, can't help himself. He rises up, and it says, and he shouted out. He said, he cried out in a loud voice, Come to me, all ye who thirst. And out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. <laughs> That's what Jesus is calling us to. A living faith that we are full of the life of Christ. That our life is hid with him. And all we do is live for him and proclaim him. I mean, we have to live our life and do everything, but that is just something that can't be taken away, that wherever we go, people are going to know. The world needs us like never before. Do you, you realize that? They need us because Jesus has chosen that. This is the way he reveals himself for the most part. I know he's doing all kinds of crazy stuff these days. Muslims are getting saved by the thousands from all seeing the same dream at the same night. All over the place that's happening. It's crazy. He does that. But the primary way he does it is by sending people. And yes, he sends missionaries to Afghanistan and Nepal and India, and he sends people to go out and train people in, in Montana. But the primary way he works is the way he is working in Afghanistan and, it's, and, and, this, and in China and in Iran, which is he has his people talk to the people they know. That's how the early church grew. They went house to house and publicly proclaimed Jesus too. That's the way the church grew. That's the way we will see God use us to change our neighborhoods, our towns here, the, the area, and make us really count for the kingdom of God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So subs we want faith needs to be something that's real to us, not something we just know a definition of. And it has to be something that is, there's evidence of it. You see the guy walking with the umbrella, you believe he thinks it's going to rain. <laughs> we need to live lives that show we believe that Jesus is king and that he's coming soon and that he matters more than anything. And we do that by loving each other and reaching out in love to others around us in any way we can to build bridges and relationships, of caring relationships, and then telling them living it and then being able to tell them it's because of him it's because of him these are these are tremendous leaps that only god will do but god says right in this scripture right in the portion here telling us all about faith that he rewards those who diligently seek him 
So let's seek him. You know, I love the old hymn, Trust and Obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Trust. Reach out in faith like you never have before. Believe that he's going to show you. He's going to speak to you. He's going to guide and direct you. And then when he starts to do it, even if being afraid, it's okay to be afraid. Go ahead and obey. <laughs> Go ahead and obey because you can trust him. Amen? Lord, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you're so faithful, that you don't give up on us. And Lord, I'm, uh, it's, it's shocking and uh, humbling to think that you have chosen the way to spread your good news is through people like us, just regular people, that we are your instruments that you've chosen to use. Just as in the early days it was the ignorant, unlearned fishermen, today it's us. But God, thank you that we have a role to play. And I speak right now to everybody who's listening here and what listening anywhere, that right now, Lord, would you impart to us faith. <laughs> Open our eyes. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Lord, reveal yourself in a deeper way to us. Who has believed your report? God, help us to believe and to take the steps in that direction, even where we faltered, that may we get up and keep going. And Lord, I ask that you would help us to encourage one another in this, that we would encourage one another to do what we know we can do and believe you're going to show us more. And that just as you're using many other people around the world, you want to use us right here. So thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, for your goodness. Thank you, dear God, that Holy Spirit lives in us, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. Thank you that you will give us direction, and thank you that you will empower us to demonstrate and live out the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. For a closing song, let's turn to the Mennonite hymnal to number 541, Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord. 541. that we see Grace, freely be 
bestowed on all who believe, you that are longing to see his face, will you have some us grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace of no pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Thank you, Pastor Jim, for that challenge of faith. Seeing the invisible, believe the impossible, and believe it's for us. But I was challenged this morning, and I believe each one of us have been challenged. I believe we've been given a test. Unknowingly, I think Jim has given us a test. My question is, are we going to pass that test? It's called the pace meal. And I must confess, I did not respond. In the past, I was a table host. I was planning to do that. I just didn't respond. I figured it'll happen, and I'll just be a part of it. We need to respond. I'm volunteering to be a table host, and whatever else might need to happen. Folks, we say we're too busy. Are we saying we're too busy for God? This is myself reflecting. So I'm sharing with you what I'm reflecting upon. My hunch is each of us have that reflection. Are we too busy for God? If we are too busy, there's something we need to take out of our schedule. One night a month for us to minister to those who come to our church. So I would encourage you I'm not going to say demand or you must. I am encouraging you that there's a part of this that you can be a part of, whether it's cooking, cleaning, helping, whatever table host. Please contact the officer. Let someone know that we can go forward. I would hate to have to go to Renee and say, you know what? We can't do it. I don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. So again, it's a challenge for myself. I'm putting myself out there for each one of us. Are we too busy? for God. Anyway, thanks again, Jim, for that challenge for us. That was a word for us this morning as a congregation. So thank you again. For our benediction, I invite you to stand. I invite Timmy and Garrett to come forward. And I was with them earlier this morning, and they are excited. I'm excited. Uh, Come on over here, guys. You can't hide behind the adults. I'll be here right with you. But they're going to do our benediction for us this morning. I call it leadership and training. How about you guys? Um, So they're going to lead us in the benediction. It's the verse we did earlier. So I'm going to allow Garrett and Timmy to dismiss us with the benediction. And when they're finished, you are dismissed whenever you're ready. So do Isaiah 41, 10. 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41, 10. Blessings. Go in peace. <laughs>